Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. This past week, my dad, Paul Bulos, was transferred to a hospice facility. As Richard and I reflect on my dad's life and the meaning of his death, no text in the Bible brings more clarity than Ecclesiastes. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 71 of the Bible as Literature podcast. You know, I'm honored to share with our listener community that my father is currently in hospice, dying of liver cancer. And we talk a lot on this podcast about the importance of contextualizing everything in Scripture. This is what I've been doing with respect to my dad and his life. And one thing I keep coming back to as a disciple of the Bible is that there really is nothing unique or special about my father that distinguishes him from any other human being who's ever lived. That doesn't mean that there isn't something about my father that's different than other people that I would eulogize. But the value of my father's individuality pertains not to his experience, but to the instruction that is manifest in the way that he conducts himself and in the way that he gave all of us instruction growing up. You know, we have two classes of people. We have the saints and we have everybody else. And the saints are the people who reflect the teaching. And I think a person's greatness, if you can even use that kind of language as a disciple of the Bible, But as Paul says, humanly speaking, for lack of a better way of expressing this idea, a person's greatness pertains not to their contribution, but to their submission to the one teaching that is great and above all else. It's the reflection of the gospel in one's life. But the reflection is only that. It's a reflection. It's not a reference. The reference point is always going to be the gospel. But the reference is the thing. And so if you are judged to be righteous, it's only because you reflect the teaching correctly. The gospel was here before us, and it will be here after we're gone. And our value pertains to the extent to which we amplify the proclamation of the gospel through our words and through our actions. And this is very difficult. And for some people, it feels like nihilism. It feels defeatist. But again, for those who really struggle with the Bible and try to live by its instruction, you realize that this is what infuses meaning in life. And nowhere in the Bible is this question more beautifully explored than in the book of Ecclesiastes. When we're faced with death, when we see death, I mean, it's important that monasticism takes so much time and so much emphasis on reflecting on your own death. As soon as you think you're something, you're dead. It's the opposite of the American dream, which is one day you'll make something of yourself. And you'll be better than your parents. It's not only a silly concept, this idea that the subsequent generations are greater than what came before. It's silly. It's actually empirically untrue. The fact that we benefit from a large body of knowledge is a credit to those who came before us. It's not a credit to us. Right. So no matter how you slice it, it's a stupid idea. The monk who spends time in the catacomb is exactly the same as the generations that came before him. Dead. <laughs> right. His skull will sit there with all the other hundreds of skulls, and he will end up exactly the same, and you won't be able to tell one skull from the next. And there's no self-help book. There's no psychologist. There's no pill you can take that will change that outcome. We are transient. 
We are temporary. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So beginning with the king and the one who is in charge of making sure that the law is carried out. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And this word vanity is hevel. It's the word for a wisp of smoke or steam or something. Interestingly, it's the same name as the brother of Cain, Abel. It's hevel in Hebrew, a wisp of smoke. Everything is just, that's it. And what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? What are you going to ultimately get out of everything you do? Because guess what? Once you're done doing all your work, you're dead. Well, what's interesting, too, about the terminology, and this is why the Hebrew is so important, you talk about the connection to the name Abel. In the story of Genesis, the protagonist is the one who is vanishing breath. The one whom God favored is the one who lost everything with no glory and no honor and not even a marker to signify the place where he was buried. Abel got up, went to the field with his brother, and we never heard anything from Abel again. You're talking about two brothers who represent the whole of humanity, which means that in the death of Abel, it wasn't just one man who died. It was half of civilization that was wiped out. Half a generation. Which means it's not just that this one person was a vanishing breath. So what does that say about the individual? This is the question. This is the anti-Hellenism of Ecclesiastes. It offends me when people say that Ecclesiastes is a philosophical text. It is anti-philosophical. It offends me when people say it's a nihilistic text. It is anti-nihilistic because what looks like nihilism to the human being is life in the hand of God. It looks like nihilism to us because we want to be God. And if we can't control what we call life, we don't understand it as life. But Ecclesiastes is pointing to something greater. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Humanity is just one generation after the next. A bunch of kids are born, a bunch of old people die, and then those kids have children and then they die. To understand how the preacher in Ecclesiastes views humanity, you have to think about how you view your garden. A plant grows, its seed falls to the ground, and then another plant grows up in the same place. This is the way that the preacher understands humanity. We are, in Genesis, no different than anything else that comes out of the ground. And Adam's sin was his denial of this fact. So here, that's what we're hearing. You are no different. You're just a crop that comes up and dies, and a new crop comes up, and nothing changes. Right. He asked the question, what profit hath a man? And so now we're seeing. What do you see? You make a plant grow, and then it goes. And the sun also arises, and the sun goes down, and hasteth to a place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to the circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place From whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. So look at the wind. Look at the mighty rivers. What do they accomplish? Nothing. The wind gets to the end and then just turns around and comes back. The water goes to the ocean and it never seems to fill the ocean. It just keeps going. What does a human being have to offer in this gigantic system that exists? This is to put human beings in their place. This is one thing I really like about cosmologists who really understand the insignificance of human beings in the scope of the cosmos. I mean, just in the scope of natural forces on Earth, human beings are insignificant. This is why it sounds so ridiculous to me, to my Semitic brain, when environmentalists talk about saving Mother Earth. How can you save your mother? Now, I realize that we can change our behaviors collectively to reduce the damage we're causing or hopefully stop the damage. It's hard to say at this point. But embedded in the attitude that we can save Earth is the very sin that is producing the destruction of creation. We give ourselves way too much importance. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And, and there, there is, is no new thing under, under the, the sun. sun. That's a verse we both know very well. I think people need to key in on this, that there really is nothing new. So when we look at the context of your beloved father, there's still nothing new. He's your dad. He's a unique person. But how unique really is he? He's another person who is born, who's going to die to you. Okay, but how much does your opinion 
matter in the long run because in four generations, no one's going to know you. No one's going to know me. Maybe there's going to be a podcast in an archive someplace that somebody cares about, that somebody will discover, some digital archaeologist will discover this. Who cares? In Ecclesiastes, there's an answer to the question, who cares? But the perspective of that answer is not a human perspective. Because when you and I are saying, who cares? We're thinking about the importance of Richard Benton or of Mark Bulos. But when scripture says, who cares? It's thinking about the importance of God. This is what I meant at the outset of the podcast, that one's value pertains only to the instruction, not to the individual. Because at the end of Ecclesiastes comes this very important section on judgment. So the value of my dad's time in this life will be measured at the end of time in Ecclesiastes when God decides whether or not his instruction was followed for the sake not of the individual, but as it pertains to the common good and God's providence for the entire creation. I think this is the problem with Adam's disdain for the ground from which he was taken. God did not make Adam. He made creation of which Adam is a part. And to take a stand to the contrary, to forsake the humility of modern cosmology, if there is such a, a humility, is what leads to so much destruction and abuse and evil. So this is where, to my ear, again, Ecclesiastes is not nihilistic. It's simply undermining human narcissism. It's undermining the things that human beings think bring meaning to nothing. But the human being cannot bring meaning to what is nothing. That's the point. We had a conversation last week talking to someone about brutality in the world, the brutality happening in the Middle East. And someone said, well, here in the U.S., I think we've come to a point where we've gone beyond that now. I think the next verse is important because it says, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. The assumption of the statement that the person we were talking to was that there's this progress. We're always getting better. But you know, there's nothing new. There's always been people who say, we've now overcome this brutality. I'm sure the Romans in the second century were saying, see, now we had a time of war, but now we have peace. We have the Roman peace that exists. Sure, we have little things going on here and there, but we're much better than the Persians, much better than the Germans. The example you gave was the brutality of ISIS. People are talking about the horrible things that ISIS does, and they are horrible. They are unspeakable. They are disgusting. But here in Minnesota, where we live... The biggest mass hanging conducted by the U.S. government happened in Mankato, Minnesota, under the auspices of Abraham Lincoln. During the war with the Native Americans, there were over 30 people who were executed at one time. Now, is it humane to hang people by the neck? Or is it humane to cut off people's necks? Is this what we're talking about? Because really, the people in ISIS would say that there was a legal reason for killing these people, and chopping off their heads was the correct and just thing to do. Now, we say, what kind of brutal law is that? But if we can do that, can't the other person say, what kind of brutal law allows you to execute 30 people who may or may not have been guilty? I think the point isn't that ISIS is right. They're not right. Correct. I think the point is that we are blind if we imagine that we are something other in terms of our own conduct. There's nothing new under the sun. This whole Minnesota nice nonsense is built on the execution of these Native Americans. And these are the 30 that we heard about because it was a big event. This does not account for the thousands across the country, the millions who were either executed or taken into captivity or killed in war. Is it brutal to put the heads of your enemies on a stake? Is it brutal to have the scalp of your enemies around your belt? What's the difference? When you build a nation, this is what happens. When you come into a place, this is what happens to the native people. This is what happened in the U.S., and it's very easy for us to say, oh, we're now beyond that. We have now evolved. But here in the text, okay, you evolved. 300 years. Who cares? One's dead, another one's dead. ISIS arose, ISIS fell. 
Who cares? It all goes back to the dust. It, it is, all goes back to the, the dust. The earth, as Alexander Schmemann used to say, is a whirling graveyard. It's a very nice way of summing up Ecclesiastes. It's beautiful. Even the outrage you have is passing away. The thing that you're outraged at is passing away. It's all going, not to an extreme nothingness, like we would say nihilism, but like you say, it's ultimately aiming towards the justice and the judgment, which we keep alluding to. It's in the last chapter. We're going to get to it much later, but that's what's important here. You come to nothing, but the creator of the heavens and the earth, who was here before you and will be here after you, does not come to nothing. So in the next section, the king now runs his experiments to kind of tell if there's a way to discover some kind of meaning from life. So this is the way that he contextualizes his discussion, this ultimate big system where everything just is swirling around from beginning to end. It's a big monopoly board. You just keep going around and around and around. You're not going anywhere. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. So he's using his wisdom to try and run an experiment. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. So the things you're outraged about, you're not going to change them. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. There's always stuff that's not going to work out. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. I'm the king of Jerusalem. I am the wisest of kings of Jerusalem. I am the pinnacle of wisdom. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I wanted to know the whole gamut. From the top of wisdom all the way to the bottom of stupidity. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. So what he learned was that the wiser you get, the more trouble you're making for yourself. What's the point in gaining more wisdom? What's the point in understanding better? Because you're ultimately just going to understand more of the problems in the world that you're not going to be able to change. So I think the critique here is that gaining wisdom is a sacrifice. Gaining wisdom and understanding is going to make more trouble for you. Today, we were talking about how the ultimate self-righteousness is to think that you can impose a certain way of the world onto the world. The world is supposed to be a certain way. And so your labor, in terms of Ecclesiastes, is to make the world work a certain way. But Ecclesiastes, right off the bat, says, Okay, first of all, it's not wise because you aren't understanding the way the world works. So the more wise you become, the more you're going to understand that you can't impose anything on the world. This is sanity. Sanity yes. is you can't impose a vision of the world onto the world. Therefore, your self-righteousness is undermined by wisdom. But what's replaced is a self-emptying. And this is where Paul, I think, understood that his people could very easily be led to nihilism because, I mean, we've seen it happen among our own friends. You know, people who like understand that like there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can change. There's nothing that you can benefit anybody else with. So what's the point? And Paul fills it with love and with Torah that by being obedient, you're not going to do anything new under the sun. You can already just put that to the side. You can do what those who came before you strove to do and you can love others, but you're not going to contribute anything. You're not going to stop the wind from making its circulation. I think this is the key, that people really get it wrong when they use the word nihilism with respect to Ecclesiastes. What Ecclesiastes is, is what scripture is. It's fatalistic. In other words, it simply looks at how things work and then accepts that you have no control over this and that names it the wisdom and the judgment of God. And then you live, as you said, with a kind of sanity that understands your place in the cosmos, which is barely, I mean, to say a vanishing breath is an exaggeration in terms of the worth of the individual. I'm really excited about how this even undermines our pursuit here and doing the podcast. I think that someone can say, so what are Father Mark and Richard trying to do? More vanity of vanities. You know, we could rename the podcast instead of the Bible as literature, vanity of vanities. Sure. But what I value from that is that there's always this critique. We are under scripture ourselves. 
And we have to wonder, are we on the path that we want to be on? Are we following Torah in what we're discussing, in how we're discussing? And I like that Ecclesiastes stands there as a judgment for us, lest we think we're going to contribute and change. We're not going to contribute and change. All we're going to do is try to continue to pursue wisdom, understand that our own desire to change the world is vanity of vanities. Absolutely. But by offering this word, we can gain wisdom from Scripture and hopefully impart this wisdom of Scripture to our listener. We were very fortunate to be discipled by our teacher, and we have a responsibility and an accountability to make sure that we do the same for others. After that, it doesn't matter. We can go to the grave and rest with my dad and his dad and everybody else. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.